excuse me, and you see on the right one of his uh, photographs um, taken on the South Tower of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. In, in 1852, he was commissioned as one of a number of photographers by the French government to undertake a photo documentation of the monuments of France. So putting this new artistic medium to a kind of documentary purpose to go around France and photo document the old buildings, the old structures, and distinguished monuments of, of France. And we think that that's where he became interested in wrought iron, because he was actually going through um, small towns and small cities in France and photo documenting mostly Gothic, uh, Romanesque, and Romanesque churches. And he seems to have become very interested in the wrought iron that was used to decorate those old structures. Um, and at the same time that he was starting to get interested in this material, uh, keep in mind that this is a moment when the city of Paris begins to be radically transformed and modernized itself in the late 19th century under the, the direction of Baron Haussmann. So that um, the old medieval tangle of streets, the, the map of, of Paris, which had grown in a very topsy-turvy way over the centuries, um, was, was seen to, to need a, a total modernization. And um, under Haussmann's plan, uh, many of the old, narrow, and twisted, and winding streets in the, in the city, throughout the city, were literally sort of swept away and replaced by wider, wider streets, by the boulevards, the facades of buildings, if buildings weren't torn down. Buildings were actually, um, act, uh, had their facades redone so that the um, city of Paris would look like a modern city. And you see on the right here, uh, before and current um, photograph of the same street in Paris, where you can see the former um, sort of small rows of, of buildings that, that were torn down and um, the street widened and regularized. And this happened all over the city. This was happening um, at, at a rate and at a, at a pace that meant that much of the um, building material that was being torn down was simply being discarded. Um, and that included a lot of wrought iron decorations that ornamented the exterior of old buildings. So balcony grills or railings, grates of, of all kinds that used to be on the facades of buildings, Signs, as we'll see, signs become a very important part of what Henri Lissac was, was doing in terms of his collecting. These things were literally being thrown away. And so Henri Lissac started to collect this material in earnest. And he was quite literally going to salvage yards and going to junk stores and buying 17th and 18th and sometimes early 19th century pieces of wrought iron that he saw as part of the cultural patrimony of France that was being basically discarded and, and not valued, and began his collection um, at that time and uh, really passed along his passion for collecting to his son, who was also named Henri Lissac. So here's a picture of the younger Henri Lissac um, in his older years um, holding an iron lock in his apartment and he actually took his father's passion for collecting and really ran with it. He, he was bit by the collecting bug in a major way, which is how the museum ended up with so many thousands and thousands of examples. And in fact, he started to collect certain things in great depth and, and in, in huge quantity, but always mindful of quality and condition and rarity and, and age. Um, both he and his father were quite interested in what they perceived as the sort of antique or older wrought iron. So even though their collection did include some things that were contemporary, contemporary to them, they were really uh, collecting um, a much older material. On the right, you see a page from a catalog that was published shortly after Henri Lissac established his museum that shows a few of the many, um, actually I think there are several thousand uh, wrought iron keys in the collection. Well, so he had been collecting um, and I, filling up his apartment with iron and putting it in nooks and crannies wherever he could find it. And by the turn of the 20th century, 
um, the, the, there was a recognition that, in fact, this, this material was of important historical um, value. And uh, in 1900, with the World Exposition that took place in Paris that year, um, Henri Lesseff was asked to lend some of his ironwork for displays in the, in, in the World Exposition. And in fact, he loaned about 1,000 pieces of wrought iron. And they were shown in a series of stands in the 1900 Paris Exposition. And you see one of the installation shots here. So uh, this, this material was, was again you know, seen as now uh, valu valuable and interesting artifacts from France's cultural and artistic and, and historic past. So that's one of the installations. And here's another one of the views of the installation in the 1900 Exposition. And I, and I should say that a number of the things that he loaned to that, um, that display are in our show, including this, this is in the show, this is in our show, this is in our show. And, it, and if I go through, there, there are about five um, uh, installation photographs of that 1900 display, and many of the pieces that we have here at the Clark now were actually included in that um, exhibition. So after, um, the, in, in the early 20th century, he decides that he wants to create um, his, a museum. And he approach, starts to approach the various governments, first the French government in Paris, um, and then eventually the city of Rouen, um, to offer his collection as a donation. But it, he had, a, um, he had a, one very important um, restriction or requirement, and that is that he required that a building be dedicated to this collection, that it would all be put on view, or as much of it as possible put on view, and that this building really be um, a single collection museum dedicated to his collection of wrought iron. So he, um, as I said, he first offered it to Paris. They couldn't offer him the right building. He went to the town of Rouen, which is not too far away from Paris. This, this town fathers of Rouen offered him two different buildings. They really did want this collection, but he didn't want either of those buildings. He knew the one that he wanted. And so he said, I'll take that building. And it was a church. It was actually a de deconsecrated church that was built in the 15th century, um, but had been um, uh, decommissioned as a church during the Revolution, and then had been renovated by the city of Rouen in the early 20th century and opened as a museum of Normandy art. And so he saw, I think he must have seen some kind of, of um, a, a real affinity between the architecture of this building and his collection because he said to the people in Rouen, you know, that's the building that I want for the Museum of Iron. And so they took all of the other art out, they moved it elsewhere, and in fact, um, the Musée Le Sec de Tournelle opened in Rouen in 1921 in this building where it still exists today. So here are pictures of the, uh, of the building and the museum when it first opened in 1921. You see Henri Lesec, he's right here on the opening day of the, of the installation. And here is an early interior view of this, of this uh, collection and, in, and the installation, which he himself, Henri Lesec, um, organized. So I first went to this museum about 10 years ago. I was in Rouen on other business, and I kind of wandered into it. And over the years, uh, the displays have become more and more dense, I would say. And to go into the, this old church building now and to see this collection of ironwork is, is truly a staggering experience. So here's one view of the interior of the museum in Rouen. And this actually makes it look very ordered. I'll show you another view in a minute that, that gives you more of a sense of what it's actually like to experience this old collection of iron in this Gothic building. It's really an unforgettable experience. The material is not displayed in any kind of truly thematic way or chronological way, although there are things that are grouped together, um, particularly small things are grouped together in cases. But the ironwork covers the interior of this Gothic church from the floor to the ceiling and in nooks and crannies so that as you explore the building, you just see iron everywhere. 
And it's really a, a, a wonderful experience. It's kind of an unforgettable, um, sort of magical, um, sort of stumbling upon all of these treasures. And, and material that, you know, I think, I think for a lot of people is just sort of un, unfamiliar. Um, it's really a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. And, and going there and seeing it, and seeing it the way it is, it was, it is installed, has always kind of stuck with me as one of those just great museum experiences that you can have in this, in this world. So, why did we do an exhibition of part of this collection here at the Clark? Well, we've done exhibitions a few times in the Michael Conforti Pavilion. And this is an installation view of the first one we did in the summer of 2014, which was dedicated to a collection of ancient Chinese bronzes that came from the Shanghai Museum. Um, and then last year, you might remember that we used it again for an exhibition, and we had our Picasso exhibition in that Conforti Pavilion. But in order to show the Picasso paintings and prints that were part of that exhibition, we had to do several things. We had to build a complete building inside the building. So we had to create the lighting conditions that were acceptable for paintings and works on paper. And not only did we build all of these walls that completely blocked off the views inside and outside the pavilion, we even put these screens halfway down those windows because even these walls didn't quite go to the ceiling and the light coming <coughs> over those walls without putting the screens down was just putting too much light on, on the works of art. So after that experience, we were talking about finding other projects that we could do in that space, as wonderful as the Picasso show was, and it was a great exhibition. But we wanted to do other projects in that space that didn't have light restrictions. And one of the great things about metalwork is that for the most part, it doesn't have any light restrictions. So we started to think about where could we find a group of metalwork uh, that, that would do well in, in this beautiful uh, Ando designed pavilion. And um, my colleagues and I thought about the Musée Le Sec de Tournelle and their amazing collection of wrought iron. And also about the idea of doing something with the wrought iron collection from Rouen that is it's similar in, in some ways to the display approach that you find in, in the museum in France but also unique because it, 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 rather than putting this old material in an even older Gothic building, we're taking this old material and putting it in a very modernist building, a 21st century building, and liked the idea of trying to capture something of the excitement of running across this material, but doing it uh, within the Ando building and that, in that really beautiful architecture with all of those incredible views through the glass windows of the space. So that was the sort of um, the goal. So about a year ago, um, I went back to the Musée Le Sec, and I had a great um, task in front of me, and that was to construct a checklist of objects for an exhibition to be shown here at the Clark in the Conforti Pavilion. So again, the, their collection has some 16,000 pieces total in it. I think in the display at the museum itself, there are over 4,000 things on view. And in the Conforti Pavilion, the exhibition that we have today, there are 36 objects. So that's quite a, a selection and, and a kind of a culling. So, you know, it was really kind of a, it was kind of a wonderful experience, I have to say, that the, my colleagues at the museum in Rouen could not have been nicer, they couldn't have been more generous. There was only one work they said basically don't even think about asking to borrow that because it's so fragile and it's like, it's like they're one of their oldest things. But otherwise, I was basically walking through the, this wonderful museum and saying, wow, wouldn't it be great to have that piece and that piece? And actually, if you look at this installation shot that I've shown once already, you can see a number of the things here that are actually in our show. So we have this shoe sign, we have this sign, and I'll talk a little bit more about the signs and different things um, in a moment. We have, this is a lockbox that's in our collection. Uh, we have a number of, of other things that are, you can, 
you can sort of get glimpses of in these photographs. This key is in our in our exhibition. This one of their sort of signature objects is in our exhibition. This grill, this grill. I walked through the museum with with their staff and we're, and basically was taking notes and uh, about the things that I thought would go well in our exhibition. And again, they were they they were extremely generous with us. I mean, some of the things that are in the Concordia Pavilion now are actually the, the sort of signature pieces of their museum. So we were very fortunate to be able to, to really create a checklist that was tailor-made for the, for the idea I had of what we could do in our own space. But then we needed to do something within the Conforti Pavilion to actually install these works, because even though we weren't going to build entire wall structures as we did for the Picasso show. If you look at the floor plan of the Conforti Pavilion, there basically are no hanging walls. I mean, most of the walls, these are the, these are the glass windows. Those, that's glass, that's glass. These are obviously glass in the door. So there are very few walls where you could actually hang art of any kind any, in any way. And so um, we had a wonderful sort of opportunity to take the space and, and mold it for, um, for this project. And I reached out to a designer that we had worked with before, a man named Jared Beck, and there he is. We worked with him on the 2016 um, installation up at the Lunder Center called Sensing Place. And I knew he's, he's an artist himself, he's a sculptor, he's a very, very brilliant designer. And I knew that if I gave him this material and gave him the sort of charge to think about installing this material in a way that, that celebrated the architecture of the Concordia Pavilion and also sort of set off these, these wonderful old <coughs> objects, that he would come up with something really exciting. I wasn't ready really for what he showed us when he came up with his plan, because he showed us this plan. Um, and when, when I shared this with my colleagues who are in charge of fabrication here, um, Paul Dion, who some of you may know, I think he put his head in his hands and he was just like, oh my God, because as, as it turns out, when you walk through the installation, if you pay attention and look at it, you will see that there is barely a right angle in the entire fabrication design. But that was what was so exciting about it, and Paul agreed with me too. I mean, we all found this to be just a really kind of, it, it, um, a design that responded to the material and also energizes the Conforti Pavilion in a certain way. And actually, uh, Jared's, Jared's um, inspiration was really, came from the material itself. It came from the idea that many of the things in this exhibition were being salvaged from the old streets of Paris. So walking through the installation now, it's a little bit like rambling through some old funky streetscape. Um, and, you, you, and you encounter the objects um, you know, from different perspectives. Again, they're, they're not installed exactly like they are in Rouen. They're not from the floor to the ceiling. But they're definitely all over the place in terms of where your eye um, seeks them out and finds them. And I think that the, um, the installation is, is really successful from my point of view. So now I want to spend a little bit of time and talk about what's actually in the show, what, what we selected and what we're displaying in the show. And so there are several large categories of, of objects in, in the art of iron. And one of the biggest ones is shop and insides. This is actually one of the concentrations of the collection in France. It's something that both the father and the son, Lissac, were very interested in. And, uh, and they have a very large uh, uh, collection of objects that used to be used for signs, for businesses, for hotels, and for inns, for nightclubs, different kinds of businesses. And they actually harken back to a time when these kinds of signs would have been found everywhere in the streets of any city in Europe and even any city in America large or small, and there are a few places in the world where you can still go and get a sense of what streetscapes used to look like. And one of them is in Salzburg, Austria. 
This is the main shopping street in Salzburg, which has retained this tradition of using these wrought iron, painted wrought iron shop signs to indicate all of the businesses along the street. These actually, the, this kind of, of, of sign, sometimes projecting over the, the street, sometimes affixed flat to the facades of buildings, these signs were truly ubiquitous in the 18th, and the 17th, and the 18th centuries. And this was a time, keep in mind, when, when literacy was not widespread. And so having signs that actually could indicate what the business was without necessarily using words was actually very important um, to the viability and success of businesses. It was also a time when buildings were not numbered. Um, it, it took a long time before the idea of actually put, assigning numbers to buildings took hold. And so people would navigate by landmarks and signs also became important parts of navigation um, within cities. Um, th this, this picture, which I'll just link around for one more, one more minute before turning to some of the signs in the exhibition, um, it is an indication of or, or a kind of a reminder of how prevalent these signs had been at one point. And in the 17th century, both in the, in the city of London and the city of Paris, there were multiple laws that were passed that prohibited um, business owners from affixing signs such as these to their businesses. They, they, they were um, regulated in terms of their size and their weight because these signs had proliferated to such an extent, and they're so heavy, because wrought iron is quite heavy, that they were actually falling down, breaking off of the buildings, breaking pieces off of the buildings, falling onto the sidewalk below, and in some cases, killing people. So they had to, they had to try to pass regulations for the protection of, of uh, people who were under, underneath <coughs> these shop facades. And we know that uh, the laws were very ineffective because the signs continued to be made and they continued to be used um, well into, well, it, even today you still find signs, maybe not to the extent as you do in Salzburg, but you still find them in many places. So here are some of the signs that are in our exhibition. And um, we really tried to make a selection of, of different kinds of signs and signs that do their work sometimes in very um, clear and obvious ways, and sometimes in ways that may have been obvious at the time that the sign was in use, but are not so obvious to us now. Um, I love the fish sign. If you go up and you look at these cast iron fish, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, wrought iron fish, um, everything in the exhibition is handmade wrought iron, um, sometimes uh, made with, um, with roll iron that's being bent and welded on the, on the forge and on the anvil. Sometimes in the case of these fish, with iron that's been rolled or, or hammered into sheets and then formed into their like sculptures, their hollow uh, sculptures of fish. And they're extremely lifelike and realistic. Um, this is a sign from a florist shop, very beautiful, retains some of its original polychromy. This is a sign from one of the oldest things in the exhibition, around, it's from around 1600. Um, and it's, we know actually the shop that it stood in front of because it was a famous sign from a very famous and very old cloth merchant shop, a draper shop in Paris. Um, and the sh name of the shop, the name of the street the shop stood on, which is still there, and the name of the sign, they're all called the Dry Tree because the, tr the dry tree was actually a legendary tree that, that was said to, to have grown up on this vast plain in the Middle East in the exact spot where Alexander the Great and Darius fought a battle. And it was along the Silk Road. And it was seen as from people uh, people's imaginations on, in the West as the demarcation between the West and what, what would have been known as the Orient or Asia. And so the dry tree became this kind of marker of the idea of the luxurious things that were coming to Europe from the Silk Road, including silks and luxury fabrics. And so the drapers ad adopted the dry tree as the symbol of their guilt. And, uh, and that would have been very recognizable at the time that the sign was in use. And there are still a few things that we recognize when we see a sign 
that we may not even really remember where the reference came from, but think of the sort of striped barber pole uh, uh, that, that denotes a barber shop. And we see that and we know what it means. Uh, and the same thing would have been true of a, of a form like that. And another wonderful sign uh, from an inn called the Golden Axe. And you have a, an axe here that's gilded. And this does have a few words on it, a lache d'or, the golden H. But the word um, for the French word H also sounds like the word for axe. So it's kind of a play on words. Another, um, well, sign, we, we're not actually sure what this bracket would have been used for. Um, it, is, it is a bracket with a dragon perching on the top of it. And what I mean by bracket is that this, with its um, structure, could have been affixed to a, to a facade to hang over um, a building, or it could have been affixed to um, hang um, perhaps a lantern, something hung from this loop, and we don't know what. But we do know who made this amazing work. It's one of the few things in the exhibition that's actually signed. And that's an interesting um, note about the materials in this exhibition are, are, are mostly made by anonymous master craftsmen. These were made by ironsmiths at the very top of their craft and of their trade, um, but they weren't necessarily thought of as artists, um, and they usually did not sign their works. The only things in the exhibition that are signed are this dragon and then a few of the um, the locks and I, I'll sh uh, a few of the sort of technical objects, and I'll show you some pictures of those in a moment. But this one was signed actually by, by the fabricator, so we know that it's made by this man, Pierre Boulanger. Um, he was actually a very, very um, successful ironsmith in the mid 19th century. He was working um, on the renovations of Notre Dame Cathedral that were going on at the time, working under the architect Villers Le Duc. And Pierre Boulanger was responsible for uh, the strap work on the main portals of Notre Dame. So you, you look at these beautiful doors and you think, you know, that these are 12th century, but they're not. They're mid 19th century um, because they were in such bad repair that Pierre Boulanger sort of studied what the original um, designs looked like and then replicated them. So he was thinking about. Um, he was thinking about the Gothic when he created um, this wonderful dragon. Another sign in the exhibition is this, um, this sign called At the, uh, at the Armed Man, L'Homme Armé, and it's another example of a sign where we actually know where it originally stood in the shop that it stood uh, above, because we have a picture of it hanging on, uh, above this, this wine business um, in a photograph that was taken by the photographer Eugène Atje right around the turn of the century. And it must have been taken right around the time that this business went out, went out of business and the sign was salvaged by Henri Lissac for his collection because also in 1900, so this photograph is thought to have been taken right around 1900, but also later that year, this sign shows up in the 1900 World Exposition. So there it is again in, on a page in the catalog, and you can see that sign in our show. Just a few other signs. The fabulous bat, uh, probably a cabaret sign. This uh, sign from a piece of cut rolled iron, we have no idea what kind of business it was for, but I love this 18th century sort of conception of a crowned dolphin with his kind of toothy grin. Um, and I knew that we, I had to have him for our exhibition. And then um, another, another sign that's more like a sculpture, this, this sort of bull that's, that's painted white. And, and many of these things would have originally been painted. Um, iron has to have its surface protected because it, it rusts. Mm -hmm. And so many of these things were gilded or they were painted, sometimes very bright colors. Um, and some of them still retain um, a parts of those um, the, the original polychromy and, and surface uh, color. So just a, a quick view of how we have a few of those things installed in the show. Then we also have a, a, a big selection or a selection of gates and grills. And this is another part of the collection at the Musée Le Sec in Rouen that is extremely rich and, and, and very large. 
Um, and I really loved the idea of bringing a lot of gates and grills into the Conforti Pavilion, um, in part because I, st I started to think about a, a, an object like this beautiful gate that's in our um, gate door, that's in our exhibition, and how in the 18th century when it was made, it actually fulfilled some of the same functions that the curtain wall of glass in the Conforti Pavilion functions today. So it kept out intruders, and it let in air and light. And the, while the, the curtain glass doesn't let in air, it certainly lets in the light and it keeps things out. So I was thinking about how these old architectural motifs have been overtaken by modern uh, materials, modern construction materials. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why these things were being discarded even in the 19th century in such, in such numbers. They were being out, they were outmoded in some ways. They were being replaced by other materials. But uh, gates and grills were ubiquitous in cities. I mean, they still are to some extent. You're all familiar with walking through Paris or New York or any, any the old part of any city and seeing balcony grills such as this one. There were design books that were published so that um, uh, metalsmiths and architects could get inspiration for different kinds of, of designs for grills, for, for railings, for balconies. And we have a number of really extraordinary pieces in the exhibition. Again, sort of handpicked from the Musée of the Sex collection, um, such as this beautiful transom grill um, from a Belgian building. Again, we don't know exactly which building this came from. It must have been very grand, given the size of the transom. And it's, it is, again, almost like a sculpture if you start looking at some of the detail. And when you go into the galleries, look at it closely, because, I mean, the this is a quiver with arrows in it, and the arrows are all like little pieces of sculpture sticking out of the quiver. And this beautiful double-sided um, round uh, grill that um, it was from a building in Amiens in France. There's our gate again, a chapel grill, beautiful object with a lot of its original polychromy, another balcony grill. I love the way that, that these objects all have their own um, design and, and you know they're they're so beautifully imagined they're so beautifully rendered um, when I was working on planning the exhibition and I, I needed to learn a lot about wrought iron really quickly because it was not something I had really studied in depth before one of the things I did is I met with a working ironsmith um, and I showed him pictures of all the things that were going to be in the exhibition um, I met him at his forge and really tried to understand some of the techniques of, of ironwork. And, and he told me, and I've heard this from other blacksmiths I've, worked, I've, I've since spoken to, that these objects are truly amazing, kind of astounding from a craft um, perspective. The, the, the technical um, challenges of creating things that are so perfectly symmetrical and perfectly formed, they look like sculptures. They almost look like, you know, lace work in some, in some ways. But this is hard and very difficult material to work with. And so the, the craftsmen who were making these were truly at the top of their game. So these grills, um, I, we had the idea of sort of putting them on the wall so that they feel like they're kind of floating. And again, you get the sense of, of Jared's sense of design where none of the, none of the walls have right angles. Um, and here it is um, in the installation uh, with a few of these things. I also wanted people to be able to see through some of the things. So you can see through the gate, see through that circular grill. Another uh, small part of the collection, of the exhibition here, the very large um, part of the collections in Rouen um, have to do with locks, locking devices, keys, and, uh, and then we also borrowed a few of the beautiful lecterns um, that um, are in the museum in, in the Musée Lesec. So this is one of the most fabulous objects in the show, and I'll talk about it more in a minute. It's a lockbox, and it was made by, uh, through very specialized firms. Uh, the, 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 um, the specialty of being a locksmith, uh, creating keys and locking <coughs> devices, was in a very important subspecialty within iron working. And here's just a picture of a, of a locksmith shop in the 18th century that shows you how many people were working in these kinds of shops and all of the different tasks they were doing to create an object like that lockbox. 
or like this one shown in, shown in, a, in an engraving that shows the mechanism on the interior of the lid and how strong it is. It's reinforced all of these different pieces and parts that, that go into it. And indeed, this box, uh, which is an 18th century box made in Nuremberg in Germany, which became a very um, famous um, special, specialized um, location for the creation of these types of secure boxes. Uh, this box is really an amazing object. So we don't know who made it. We don't know who it originally um, belonged to either, even though on the lid there are the original initials of the owner's name. It's A and an S. We know it had to have been someone who was um, very wealthy. There's a, a coronet or a crown here, a double-headed eagle, perhaps a member of the Habsburg family, but we don't know exactly who it was. But the box itself is truly ingenious and, and quite an, an astonishing object. If you think of, so you're seeing the inside of the lid, but think about that lid closed, so you just see the locked box. You would probably think, that, and you're meant to think, that this is where you put the key in to open the box. But in fact, the mechanism for locking the box is completely underneath the lid. It's all built into the lid, and you're seeing all of that mechanism here. So the key actually gets inserted um, into this. You actually, the key um, hole is behind this plate um, that has the, the owner's initial. And, and when you put this key, into the, into the keyhole and turned it, 18 bolts simultaneously were moved out or into position. So it's, it's quite an, an incredible mechanism and device. And I just, I have a picture of, yeah, uh, there is the key in the hole. You see how this um, plate has popped up? So you can actually, if you look at this, you can see that it has a hinge. If you press on the eagle's left talon, so I'm telling you the secret, it opens up, it pops open that lid so that you can find the keyhole and put the key in. Really, it's, it's the, and, and it is probably the heaviest thing in the exhibition. It is not the, the, the largest thing in the exhibition. But this lockbox was made to be secure. I mean, not only is the lid held in place by 18 bolts, but also, this thing is massively, massively heavy. It, it weighs more than you would think it looks, even though it looks like it might, must be heavy, it, is, it weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. You could not grab this thing and run out of the house with it. I mean, this was made to be, uh, to, to be something that you would keep, that would truly be like a safe, a safe uh, keeping box. I also just want to mention that, you know, working in museums, we, we have, particular challenges when it comes to handling objects. Uh, you might not be able to see very well in this photograph, but you'll be able to see in the installation that, oh, let me just point here, there are two massive handles on the side of this box. You would have to have several people on each handle picking it up and moving it because that's how much it weighs. But of course, we don't pick things up by their handles. I mean, those are 18th century handles. I mean, that's the most fragile part of any kind of an old work. So we have to figure out how to pick this thing up without using the handles and without putting pressure on any of these little pieces of metal that are all over it and sticking out in delightful ways. So that was a kind of an interesting challenge, but we did it and we did it safely and it's, it's a beautiful object. Here's another, um, we have three locking devices in, in the show, and I'm gonna show you this one as well. Um, this one is actually the inside of a safe door, so it's been taken off of, of the, you know, the, the safe that it was uh, meant to, to protect. It has, it has a intricate mechanism, not nearly as intricate as the one I just showed you, and not nearly as robust. I mean, it was clearly made for a smaller safe, you know, it's not, there, there are a number of these. These are the sort of pins that lock the door. Um, they're not, uh, they're, they're robust, but they're nothing quite like the, the one that I just showed you. It's much more decorative. Um, it has a lot of decorative brass on it as well as the, as the iron. But the fascinating thing about this safe is that you probably already spotted it. It has a pistol mounted to it. This is an 18th century English pistol by the manufacturer Wilson. It's a French, the, the door itself is French. 
And the way that, that the uh, pistol is mounted, you can see that the, tr that the trigger is, is next to this little slotted thing. The, the way that the mechanism of the safe door worked, it was designed so that on the outside of the safe door, again, you're trying to figure out like where does the key go in, wh where does the hole, where, where, you know, how do you open this door, and there are different, different you know, sort of possibilities, I guess you would say. If you tamper with this door and you don't know what you're doing, the mechanism was designed to discharge the pistol. So the pistol would fire. Now it wouldn't kill you because you're standing on the other side of the door, like looking at it, and the pistol would be firing straight to the side. But it's like, it's an alarm. It's like a, it's an intruder alarm. And it probably would scare you to death. If it didn't, it wouldn't shoot you, but it certainly would, would cause you some alarm, I think. And I, just one quick thing about this, um, this safe door. I really spent a lot of time trying to find other things like it, or you know, trying. That we actually found some examples of safes that had pistols actually built into the mechanism, not just attached, but actually as uh, that would actually that actually would have shot you if you if you had tried to tamper with it. But this one just seemed like that they took this English pistol and they attached it to this mechanism. You know, I was really intrigued to see if I could find other similar things, which I actually never did. And I was at the Winter Antique Show in New York, and I went into the booth of a very well-known firearms dealer, antique firearms dealer, and showed him pictures of this. And, and all he could tell me was, wow, I've never seen one like that before. <laughs> so I didn't get very far in trying to find uh, um, other things that were similar, but I loved the idea of the sort of alarm built into the safe door. And we have this two, the two le uh, lecterns that I pointed out that had been in the 1900 exposition that are here at the Clark in the, in, in the um, ex installation. Incredible objects, and this one in particular, this is probably the, the, um, the, the biggest thing in the show, it's one of the heaviest things in the show. It is massive, it's massive in terms of the amount of metal it, that has in it. It's incredible in terms of its level of craftsmanship and design and, and quality of manufacture. And these perfectly symmetrical um, scrolling feet, you know, each one of them exactly like the others, made out of massive pieces of iron that have been you know, bent into shape by, by, the, by the metalsmiths. I mean, a truly spectacular object. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and a huge thing, it's, the, the lectern is over seven feet tall, even if you were standing on a box in front of it, um, it's so tall that this thing would be way above your head. It's actually not a lectern that was made for preaching in front of, um, or, or, or speaking in front of. It was really, I think it was made to hold one of those giant choral books that you've probably seen in museums and libraries. Um, around around the world, so that a choir could be reading music from from a distance um, in a chapel or in a church um, with this wonderful um, lectern. So there are those two objects as they sh as they are in the exhibition. So we we put this box in the, in a case, but you can see through both sides. You can see the front and the back. And then the last section of, of objects, of last kind of category of objects that I was thinking of as I was putting the um, exhibition together was something that um, I was thinking about how prevalent iron was at one point in the household. And it was used all over the household before, again, modern materials um, took, took the place of, of wrought iron. Um, and it was used primarily in the kitchen, the laundry room, but also in the garden. Uh, equipment or um, uh, tools were made out of iron. I mean, you could find iron everywhere. And, um, and in fact, it was, it was really essential for, for, old, um, um, kitch, uh, for old cooking techniques. And for many, many centuries, this type of, of device was necessary for any kind of cooking. So it is a pot hook with a ratchet so that you can hold this pot higher or lower from the fire. This is a massive um, pot that this guy is cooking from. This is from a 12th century Bible, and this is from a 16th century painting, but you can see the same kind of device that's hanging in that old fireplace back there. I mean, everybody cooked um, over open fires until well into the late 18th and early 19th century, which is when the first sort of closed stoves, the sort of pre-runner of the modern stove, took place. 
So here in the 18th century, you see this woman is still cooking over an open fire. She's got a massive um, wrought iron pot in there. She's, she's using a wrought iron spoon. She actually is using a rotisserie that's being powered by her little dog. Not sure how realistic that is, but it's a nice idea. And, and this, this is what eventually, so eventually the fireplace right, gets filled in by, by the stove. That is the stove in Sir John Soane's Museum in London. It's one of the earliest closed range stoves. That's the precursor of what we use today. But as I said, the, uh, up until then, everybody was cooking over open fires. And so objects like this, again, the pot hook with the, with the cooking pot, were necessary for every household. And in fact, they were very often given uh, the pot hook and the pots themselves, very often made as wedding presents because it was such an essential, like, you're starting a new household. You need one of these. Um, and so this one actually, this the, the pot, which is, this pot is cast iron. It's the only cast iron thing in the show. But the pot, it has a dedication on it uh, for the couple and the year that they were married. Uh, so we know that it was given uh, to, a, to a couple as a marriage, a wedding present. And this sort of intriguing object is a coffee mill or spice mill made in the French city of Saint-Étienne, which became a, a kind of a, 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 a locus of the manufacture of these kind of specialized um, mill devices, done at a time when coffee is a very expensive commodity. So you would have something that was really quite wonderful and quite expensive itself to grind your very exotic coffee. Uh, so we have an example of that in the exhibition. Um, from the garden, we have a fantastic water spout in the form of a snake that was part of a garden um, out, uh, in a chateau outside of Paris. One of my favorite objects in the exhibition, and I love looking at this piece and thinking about how it was made, is from the mid, uh, middle of the 17th century. It's, it's just it's so simple, but it's so convincing and compelling. You know, a long bar of iron that's been shaped and twisted um, and, and make you know wider at the front and narrower and narrower till it gets to the little curly cue of the snake's tail. And it has to be rounded. It has to be the surface is all worked over to give it the sense of snake skin. And the front of the iron bar has been sort of pried open to create a mouth and to create snake teeth. And it really has a lot of personality. And there would have been at the very back of his head a pipe could have been inserted with a an opening in his mouth for water to squirt out of. Um, and so we have him installed on, on a bench. He's actually slithering toward the water feature. He's trying to get away, but we won't let him. Uh, but these other, these are all the two more signs in the show, beautiful things. And then finally, uh, the, the last two things I want to show you from the show are, are kind of uh, intriguing objects as well that, that would have been made not for use in the house, but in the yard, so to speak, or with animals. On the left is a dog collar. We have two dog collars in the exhibition. Again, these are massively heavy things, I mean, in terms of, of what they are. They would have been made for very strong dogs, dogs that no doubt would have been trained to defend property. And the spikes that stick out from the dog's neck are there to protect the dog itself from, from any kind of attack. Uh, but you can just imagine the sort of strength and ferocity of a dog that would wear a collar like this. And then on the other hand, the, the other object is one of the most intriguing things in the show. It is a bare muzzle. And it's a very interesting, very, um, very strange object. I spent a lot of time uh, reading and researching um, bear muzzles. Again, not something I ever really thought about before. And, and, and the whole history of training bears uh, to, to perform tricks. Um, and, and, and you know the sort of tradition of the dancing bear, which has really died out because of, of modern laws against um, animal cruelty and, and understanding of, of the cruelty, really, uh, of this tradition. But it used to be very, very common. I have to tell you that I've spent a lot of time thinking about this particular bear muzzle. It's a really interesting object. If, when you see it in the exhibition, if you look at this little finial at the top, which would have been up on the bear's forehead, it's in the shape of a little monster's head. And to see that, you would have to be really close to the bear. <laughs> so, and the other thing that's really intriguing to me about this, that this is kind of like a, you know, it's, it, 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 um, it's on a hinge, so it's hinged, so it, it could be strapped tight to the bear's head, 
doubtless these these kinds of um, little um, these all of these flanges were used to strap the the device to the bear. But nevertheless, this is a rel relatively fragile thing, a relatively light thing, and not a, a very robust thing to be restraining a creature like a bear. And I did find some images of, of bears who are being uh, restrained with different kinds of devices um, as they're uh, performing for, for the public. So if you look at this bear, this is from the late 19th century, I think, he actually, this is the kind of muzzle I found more and more uh, uh, examples of. It's kind of like concentric rings, again, of iron, very commonly made of iron. This is very strong to hold the bear's mouth completely shut. So it's like a muzzle, I mean, much more like a muzzle of the kind that we would think of, and probably pretty um, effective. And I think that any bear worth its salt could have torn this muzzle off of itself in an instant. So it must have been a very tame bear. It must have made, been made for a bear that truly was used to being being around around people. So it's it's a kind of an intriguing object, and um, and just one other little anecdote about the bear muzzle. When I was when I was working on the list and coming home and uh, coming back to Blainstown and sharing it with my colleagues here and shared it with sharing it with Olivier Mele, our director, and. Um, you know, I wasn't sure about the muzzle. It's just, it's kind of an, a, an unusual object. And Olivier said, oh, we, we must have the bear muzzle. <laughs> and I said, but why? And he said, because we have bears on Stone Hill. <laughs> Here's our bear muzzle. We will not use it during the course of the exhibition, but it reminds us of our own proximity to these, to these animals. And, um, and with that, I just want to say, um, I hope again that you will go to the exhibition and look at these objects again. One of the things I love about, um, about the objects is that I think that each one of them has a story to tell. It, it kind of talks about the way that life was in pre-industrial times. They're beautifully made. They're, they are, they're, they're really evocative objects, the kinds of things that you know maybe we don't really look at very carefully when we pass them on the street. But now you really have the opportunity um, to look at a selection of them and the, some of the finest things from this museum in France that they very generously lent to us for the summer. So um, I, I, I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, I hope that you enjoyed this and I hope you enjoyed the exhibition. So thank you. <laughs>
um, but uh, because I think there's there is a lot of affinity between them, even though I'm sure that there you certainly can find regional styles. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the hole in the tree for? Do they have rods going through that they put the? Yeah. So the holes. Head? So what are the holes in the tree for? And actually, it's kind of it's really fascinating. This tree has a lot of holes. Um, you can only you really only see this one, but all the way up this shaft, there are a number of piercings. There are also several places, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find them here. There's one up here. There, there are several things that are like little fittings that stick up that clearly something stuck onto. And so we don't know what, what those were used for, but clearly the tree had things hanging from it or displayed on it um, that were both perhaps tied onto it using these holes or stuck onto these pegs that you find up on it. So it's a fragment of a sign. But this sign has an interesting history because as I said, we know where it stood. It stood in, on a street in, in the first, um, in Paris, it's still there. The, 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 the graper shop that was there had been there for centuries. And it was reported that this sign, which is from around 1600, actually was a replacement for, for a much older wooden sign that had stood there before. So, that, so there are some, um, there's some information that we know about the history of this particular sign, but we don't know exactly what would have been hung on it or from it. Yes, sir? Uh, pottery and uh, uh, silverwork often have maker's marks on them mm -hmm. to identify mm -hmm. the maker. Does much of the ironwork have maker's marks? Really, if you only want the, the, so the question is, you know, pottery and silver often are marked with maker's marks um, that show the manufacturer. Um, so, and sometimes those things are really kind of quality control within the, um, the factory or kind of a, uh, with silver, a lot of that has to do with regulation of, of making sure that the silver is in, in fact the quality and, uh, um, you know, the percentage of silver is, is what the consumer expects it to be. But these things typically do not have maker's marks. The, the exception is with the locking mechanisms. Many of those were marked. Um, and the, like the coffee grind, uh, grinder is marked by the maker. So I think the more specialized objects were often marked by the, by the maker or by the, the shop that made it. But for the most part, these things were just being made by, you know, craftsmen. I mean, the, the same um, shop that was making a sign might be making horseshoes. I mean, they could be making all kinds of things. If you think of the old, and this is clearly not true of all of these craftsmen, but you think of the old smithy, you know, who was in a village, you know, doing whatever was needed in, in terms of iron, you know, uh, from the simple to the complex, you know, they would be commissioned to make the stuff that the people of the town needed. And, uh, and so we don't have a lot of information about the makers of these things, unfortunately. And they were probably almost all men, because this was a time when, I mean, there are certainly plenty of female blacksmiths today, but that would not have been the case in the 18th and 19th century. There would have been um, you know, workshops that had men and boys, as there were in all of these trades, um, doing different of the, of the tasks to make, um, to make this material. Yes? Yeah, you just, you uh, drew our attention to the remarkable symmetry of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the, cur the curly cues and the, mm -hmm. and the, the, difficult to imagine how a blacksmith could make precisely the same curve. Right. Um, it made me think about illuminated manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, mm -hmm. uh, and remarkable curly cues and patterns and initials and so on. Is there any relationship between the patterns that uh, these artists design and uh, and uh, and illuminated manuscripts? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering where they where they got their ideas from. Right. Right. Well, so, so the question is: Is uh, there any? relationship between the designs like on, on these on these grills um, these kind of um, you know all of these symmetrical and sometimes not symmetrical but swirls and and curly cues and so forth and the designs in in manuscript illumination and I think the, the answer is that you can find this kind of, of sort of arabesque design and these types of decorative designs in many different 
um, in many different applications, from medieval manuscript decoration to the engravings that are put on, for example, the engravings on armor, which is also made of wrought iron. Um, at, but I think for, for, for wrought iron itself, because wrought iron has to be manipulated, it's one thing to draw on a, you know, you have to have the skill to do it, but there is no limitation to how many curly cues you can make with your pen once you get going on a piece of parchment. But there are indeed limitations of what you can do with the physical material of wrought iron. And so there's a certain kind of, you know, of, of physics that goes into what's possible and, and what these people could achieve with, with those designs. But there's definitely an affinity. You're absolutely right. These, these things are all kind of a, from a, uh, a shared visual vocabulary and a love of you know, that kind of decorative um, motif. And that, I think this is another reason why so much of this material was being thrown away in the late 19th century and early 20th century as taste changed. And the idea that buildings didn't need that kind of ornamentation and you wanted you know, much plainer facades and, and just much you know, cleaner facades. This, a lot of this material also just fell out of fashion. Although I think it's in some ways, you know, back in fashion in, in some, to some extent, I hope. Well, thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.